At home, tip off 7.30. It's 9.06. Support for NPR comes from NPR stations. Other contributors include the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation, supporting efforts to promote a just, equitable, and sustainable society in its hometown of Flint and communities around the world. More at Mott.org. It's the Sound of Ideas from Ideastream Public Media. I'm Jenny Hamill. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanksgiving, more than any other holiday, focuses on food. Family and friends will gather tomorrow to celebrate with a big meal. But for a growing number of Ohioans, food insecurity and hunger are a reality. According to Feeding America, a nationwide network of food banks and food pantries, one in eight Ohioans and one in seven Ohio children are food insecure. The organization says that amounts to nearly 1.4 million Ohioans not having access to sufficient food. The Ohio Association of Food Banks conducted a survey in the spring of this year and found that among those receiving emergency food help, two-thirds had to make choices between buying food and meeting other household expenses. We're going to begin today's show talking about food insecurity in Northeast Ohio and how these banks are trying to help. Joining me in studio for the conversation are Kristen Warzoka. She is the president and CEO of the Greater Cleveland Food Bank. Welcome to you, Kristen. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. And Katie Carver-Reed, she's the vice president of the Akron-Canton Regional Food Bank. Katie, welcome. Thanks for having me. If you'd like to join the conversation, have a thought or a question, call 866-578-0903 or 216-578-0903. You can email us at soi at ideastream.org or you can tweet us. We're at Sound of Ideas. All right, Kristen, I'm going to start with you. Give us a picture currently in 2023 on what food insecurity looks like here in the greater Cleveland area. Well, unfortunately, uh, need for food still remains incredibly high. Uh, In our most recent fiscal year, which ended September 30th, we served as many people as we had in the first year of the pandemic. Mm. Um, And that is uh, very concerning, as you can imagine. Um, There are a number of reasons for that. One is higher costs of living. You know, we know and we've been talking with our neighbors in need um, who are just really struggling um, to to manage higher food costs, higher rent costs, higher utility costs and higher fuel costs all at the same time. And the the part of the budget that gets strained or stretched is the food budget. Um, And so they've been turning to the Greater Cleveland Food Bank, to food banks across our state and to our partner agencies really in record numbers. And Katie, uh, inflation for for your region, I mean, are you seeing it as clearly as Katie is when it comes to uh, people's need and uh, the the reality of having to decide between food and other other bills? Absolutely. Everything everything that Kristen said is true at our food bank and in our eight county service region as well. Uh, When looking at the data for this year compared to prior years, we're seeing more people visiting our network um, even than during the pandemic and a 30 percent increase in visits compared to last year alone. Um, And when we go out and we talk to people just like our friends at the Greater Cleveland Food Bank, do they tell us the same things that everything costs more? Wages aren't keeping up with that, um, and so they're having to make difficult choices. But that's why the food banks exist, is to meet people in those needs when they have them. And so um, we're certainly grateful to be able to do the work, but um, you know, it's sad that it's as high as it is. And what has been the role, um, if there is a diminishing one, of food-assisted programs that, that are being provided. Um, I know there's been talk about, uh, you know, at least ARPA do- dollars finally going away, and that's hitting lots of industries. Um, any impact on on what you do when it comes to that? Well, absolutely. I mean, one of the most important hunger relief programs nationally is the SNAP program, formerly known as food stamps. And during the pandemic, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, everyone who was income eligible for SNAP at 130 percent of poverty or less um, had a bump in their monthly benefit um, to the maximum benefit amount. And frankly, it helped a lot of people. Folks had more money to spend at the grocery store on groceries. What does that look like? Well, you know, in the case of a senior, 
their benefit could have gone from fifty dollars a month to a few hundred dollars a oh, month. Oh wow! It really made a big difference for people. And in February of this year, because that was a pandemic era benefit only, um, mm. the uh, addition, essentially the additional dollars, came to an end. Um, and you know, the senior I mentioned, for example, would have gone back to their typical amount um, at a time that groceries are just at an all-time high. And so that certainly has also had an impact um, on on many of the clients, but not all of the clients that we serve. It's just one chal- one more challenge to struggle with. And, you know, SNAP is our nation's first line of defense in the fight against hunger. Um, for every meal provided by a food bank, all food banks together nationally, SNAP provides nine. So when there are changes to the SNAP program, it has a sudden and immediate impact. I'll just add to that that when the pandemic era benefit ended, we started getting more calls from people asking where they could go to get food assistance. And we started seeing more visits at charitable food programs at the same time that those other sources of government funding that were supporting food banks and other nonprofits in the community during the pandemic are going away for the organizations serving the community and for individuals as well. Um, And so we're seeing this increase in need and less support to meet it. Yeah. So what do you do? I mean, what is the scramble for food banks in order to, uh, I mean, address this, you know, big gap? We keep showing up and doing the work every day uh, through the generosity of the community, people giving their time, people making donations. Uh, we're buying more food than we ever have. Um, and I, you know, when, I'm sure that's true for Kristen, too, and she yep. can talk about that. But uh, we're having to buy more than ever because there are also still supply chain issues and a kind of rollover from the pandemic and the food supply chain. And so we're doing the best we can with the resources we have to meet this increase in demand. And we're also expanding our capacity. You know, my fear is that um, this is not a short-term problem. Rising costs and wages that aren't keeping up um, appear to be a significant continuing issue. Um, Seniors are living longer, they're trying to age at home, and they're running out of food. And so I think Mm. both of our food banks have been working to increase our capacity to provide more food uh, across Northeast Ohio. Um, The Greater Cleveland Food Bank opened a larger partner distribution hub last year so we can distribute more food to our 1,000 partners in six counties. A couple weeks ago, we opened a new community resource center. And I know that the Akron-Canton Regional Food Bank has been a leader in their region, um, expanding capacity as well. We're trying to really plan ahead. Yeah, in July 2021, we opened a secondary facility to serve the southern part of our eight-county service region, and we're currently expanding the capacity at our main campus in Akron so that we can provide more food to the community. We'd love to hear from you. If you have experienced food insecurity or know someone who volunteers for the food banks, uh, we'd love to hear from you. 216-578-0903 or 866-578-0903. Or you can email us at soi at ideastream.org. So I'm wondering, um, you know, when you're talking about this greater need, you've hit on, um, you know, our seniors as being a a population that's in dire need. What are other populations that you have seen um, really having to juggle when it comes to providing enough food for households? Well, in addition to worrying about seniors, um, we worry a lot about working families uh, and working poor families. Um, Food banks can provide food to any uh, household up to 200% of poverty. 200% of poverty is, uh, for a family of two, is $36,000 a year, roughly or less. Um, And there are a lot of people who are not eligible for any other benefit um, because they're working, um, but they are eligible for emergency food. And we want to make sure that they have access to it. You know, we had um, literally the day before we opened our community resource center, we had a single dad and his three young boys show up in the lobby. Mm. Um, He was working full time. Uh, His kids were between the ages of, I think, six and 11. And he was just beside himself because he had found himself in need of food for his kids. You know, he's trying to figure out how he could pick up a second job Mm. um, to try to increase his income. To and he's worried about them. child care. I and, mean, oh my gosh, yes. As a working mom, <laughs> you know, I can't even imagine having to pick up a second job to care for my kids. Right. And um, but that is a position that a lot of people are facing in our community, and we need to make sure that we're available and that our partner agencies have the food that they need um, when our neighbors turn to us. 
And and I'm curious, um, Katie, it, it, what you're seeing uh, in the Akron Canton area. Again, I, I think that we're seeing a lot of the same things. And I think that, you know, what Kristen said is so important because it when I talk to people in the community, I think it's a common misconception that people aren't working when they come and need support from a food bank. And that's absolutely not true. So many of the people we talk to are working jobs, trying to find second, or I've talked to people that have third jobs. I don't even know how you can have three jobs um, and do all of the other things that you have to do to make your life go around, right? And so uh, we hear a lot about families working really, really hard um, and still needing support. And so I think what you know, Krista mentioned about seniors is certainly a concern as well. Uh, but ultimately, I think what we continue to find in this work is that you know, a lot of people are in need of food assistance, and it's not always, you know, the, the obvious people that you would think are in need of that assistance. A lot of people in the community are. And then we've got Thanksgiving looming, you know, and people who do have the resources, um, you know, going out, doing their grocery shopping already, you know, thinking about big meals and, and you know, abundance. And, and, and for those who are struggling, I mean, how are the banks ramping up for Thanksgiving? Do you have specific programs that are helping the, the folks out there? Yep. Absolutely. You want to go first? Sure. Yeah. I mean, we do a lot of work to support our hunger relief network. We, food banks generally, support lots of community organizations, nonprofits, faith-based organizations, churches um, in their ministries year-round, but certainly for Thanksgiving. And so we have distributed lots of turkeys and lots of stuffing and um, trying to make sure that everyone gets to have that experience that you're talking about to be around the table together at the holiday uh, and get to experience that with your family. Uh, For me personally, I receive food from our food bank and I got a Thanksgiving basket from our local Salvation Army. Mm. And I remember how important that was for me to have that sense of normalcy that my Mm. Thanksgiving was like everyone else's. And that's what food banks provide. We get to provide that experience as best as we can for so many people in the community because they deserve it. Kristen? Absolutely. Um, So at the Greater Cleveland Food Bank, uh, we were able to purchase back in April um, 17,000 turkeys, uh, which we've been distributing to our partner network over the last, I'd say, month or so. Um, You know, as you've both stated, the holiday, you know, Thanksgiving holiday in particular is a holiday that all seems to revolve around food. And so having a turkey, right, having a wonderful meal with your family, is just, it's the center of this holiday. And we want to make sure that as many people as possible have the opportunity to have that experience. Um, In addition to the um, turkey and other holiday products we've been providing to our 1,000 partner programs, um, we also do have some direct service uh, to neighbors. And so, um, you know, last week we had a a large scale drive through distribution in Cleveland's municipal parking lot. Um, We served more than 4,000 families in one afternoon, 15,000 people. Um, And we also have been doing some home deliveries over the last couple of days to homebound senior citizens, um, to folks who just can't get out um, to pick up the food that they need. And so we've done 700 home deliveries this week, again, of... um, food for Thanksgiving. Let's go ahead and take a call from Alan, who is listening and calling in from Cleveland. Alan, thanks for listening to The Sound of Ideas. Go ahead. Thank you very much. By the way, uh, first of all, I want to say thank you for every volunteer that helps uh, deliver food to those in need. That's very helpful. Uh, Actually, my question, I was just listening, and I think it it, uh, has... uh, ramifications of what I was going to ask. I'm a homebound senior citizen, food challenged, and my primary problem is that I'm transportation challenged. I don't have a car, and uh, most of the food banks that are offering food, you need a a car to get to. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, I was hearing the the marginal distribution there for over the years, and Mm -hmm. that's great, but I have no way to get there, and I'm just wondering if you have any plans to expand the homebound Uh, food delivery, especially to seniors, that would be extremely helpful. Yeah, Alan, um, thanks for calling in today. Um, We certainly know that there are many people in your position. And at the Greater Cleveland Food Bank, we have a help center uh, so that if someone uh, is in need of food and not sure how to access that food, you can call our help center and we will connect you with a resource. We may be able to add you uh, to our home delivery program. So uh, please do give our help help center a call. We've got folks on the phones today. Uh, and just about every day. The number is 216 738 
2067. And I'd encourage anyone else who's out there who's in need of food uh, in the Greater Cleveland Food Bank Service area um, to use that line. Or if you're not homebound, go to our website. You can put in your zip code and it will pull up partner agencies near you. A lot of times people don't realize that there could be a church that's providing food sure. right in their own community. Um, but if there's not a big sign out front, and may- many times there's not, someone who's in need of food from the first uh, for the f- food for the first time doesn't always know that it's it's available. And Ellen, if you have a hard time navigating that, you can just call back into the station and we'll get your contact info and we'll you, we'll connect you with that help center contact information yes we want to make sure um if there's help out there you should be getting it and you know i mean alan speaks to a really important point a lot of residents in cleveland don't have cars right it's true um it is absolutely true you know we've done some surveying and what we've found is that more than 90 percent of the uh, neighbors who visit our network of food pantries have some sort of transportation but that leaves 10 percent, which is a lot of people sure. <laughs> without and so that's one of the reasons that we provide um, a home delivery service for folks who really don't have any other option. And sometimes we can um, come up with other solutions as well to try to make sure that people have access to the food that they need. It's really important. Um, Our new community resource center is on a bus line, um, and that's something that we uh, wanted to ensure because we know that we'll see seniors and other folks who are taking, taking the bus, and we want to be as convenient as possible. And I know, Katie, that the Akron-Canton Regional Food Bank has a number of rural counties um, in its coverage area. So when we're talking about access and proximity to resources, I mean, is that an extra challenge for your food bank? And and how do you make sure that those individuals are, are, you know, having their needs met and uh, addressed? Yeah, absolutely. I'll I'll mention first, we also have um, a home delivery program, and I'm really proud that already this year we've done more than 20,000 deliveries uh, directly to people in four of our eight counties, some of which are our rural communities, and we're really proud of that. Obviously, we have room to expand and need to expand that. So if anyone is in one of those rural communities and wants to volunteer to be a home delivery driver, we would love uh, for you to join us in that volunteer effort. Uh, But for people living in rural communities, it is difficult. Um, And in those rural communities, there's not public transportation. And so there's not the option to even take a bus to get to a local food program. And so we oftentimes talk to people that are having to rely on a neighbor to bring food to them um, or trying to get a ride. Um, Also, proximity can be really hard in rural communities. People live farther out. And so having a central point um, can be difficult. But we've been working um, since the pandemic. One of the things we were able to do is purchase a pop-up pantry vehicle. And so we've been able to use that to go into areas and communities where we know that there aren't as many food resources as we'd like or the proximity isn't as close as it could be. And so we're trying to bring more food into communities and specifically some rural communities through that effort. Uh, We've got a listener calling in. John calling in this morning to the Sound of Ideas. Go ahead. Well, happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Happy Thanksgiving Um, to you. Well, thank you. Um, As well-meaning as some of these food banks may be, it's my feeling that they waste a lot of food in the quantities that they give out. Um, You know, don't give someone 20 quarts of strawberries. You know, it may may feel good, but a lot of it's going to go to waste. All right, John, I appreciate your call. Happy Thanksgiving to you. I mean, how do banks approach approach portion size and making sure that they're giving enough uh, to a family or an individual? But uh, also, you know, I mean, conservation is important as well. So John speaks to a a, a decent point. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, something that is often not talked about in the world of food banking or people's understanding of food banks is that we also serve an important purpose to make sure that food goes to a better intended use than going to a landfill, right? And so it's really important to us that food goes to its intended use, goes to people that need it. I think in that particular example, I just had this experience the other day. Um, I was out at a food program and I was talking to some women and they were talking about some fresh produce. We were talking about blueberries actually instead of strawberries. And a lot of times at our food programs, we encourage them to let people take what they need. And so if they want 
20 strawberries or they need 20 strawberries, they can do that. Um, And in this case with the blueberries, they were sharing recipes on how they could use that abundance to make jam that they could store for later. And so I think we try to encourage people to make the best use of uh, what they have. And so if they're taking what may seem from the outside like too much or an excess quantity that might go to waste oftentimes. Um, I found that the people that visit our network are extremely resourceful and do their best to make food stretch and last and canning and preserving is one of those ways. Um, And so again, trying to make sure that we're letting people take the items that they feel like they need, there's empowerment in that Um, and, you know, letting them put it to good use. I agree. And, you know, I've also seen um, over the years how many times um, a family or a senior or a volunteer will come to pick up for others. And so, you know, I happen to know that the very first car in line at our Muni lot distribution uh, this this last week um, was someone who um, was picking up for four other families. And, you know, they had, you know, filed all the paperwork. We knew the families they were picking up for. But, you know, what we put in the back of that person's vehicle was a whole lot of food because they were taking care of doing some home delivery, which is just wonderful. So, you know, things are not always as they appear. We have uh, just a couple of minutes. So let's go ahead and talk about the myriad ways that people can help, whether it's volunteering and maybe throughout the year, as opposed to just in the holiday season, or what stuffs and food they can contribute. Yeah, start, uh, absolutely. Um, so we always need volunteers. Volunteers, I think, really make the work possible. And so there are a lot of different ways to do that. People can volunteer at the food bank directly, um, helping to sort food and get it ready for distribution. They can help distribute to the community, like Cleveland's Muni Lot distribution or our drive through distribution as well. Uh, people can help with home delivery volunteering, like I mentioned. So lots of different ways mm. to volunteer. Um, certainly financial donations make a really big difference. Uh, food banks are able to leverage our large scale to put those dollars to good use and stretch them pretty far uh, to get a lot of food. Um, And so financial donations are extremely important. And then I think also, um, if you don't have time to do any of those things, right, I think just extending kindness to all of the people around you um, and helping to reduce the stigma that's associated with food assistance. um, Tell a positive story um, about somebody that's in need of help, uh, because I think that helps food banks too. It helps the people that we serve to feel less alone and feel less stigmatized. And so people, anyone listening to this can help us with that. Absolutely. Well said, Katie. Um, The only thing I would add uh, to Katie's great summary is that we also need folks to help us advocate. You know, this is a year where the Farm Bill um, is intended to be reauthorized. Uh, The Farm Bill not only funds SNAP, it funds um, product that food banks receive uh, from the USDA Um, surplus purchases to support farmers that are distributed through food banks, WIC, and and some other really important programs. And so um, when we have a strong group of advocates um, that are willing to share personal experiences or share their volunteer experiences or just share how important the issue of hunger is to them personally with our legislators, it's enormously helpful. Um, And so we also encourage people to contact us if they'd like to help us advocate. That's something you can volunteer to do from home, to make a phone call or write a letter or send an email. Well, my thanks to both of you, Kristen Warzoka of the Greater Cleveland Food Bank and Katie Carver-Reed of the Akron-Canton Regional Food Bank. Thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Food insecurity and food justice will be the topic of a free community discussion on November 29th at Morningstar Baptist Church. Ideastream Public Media's Director for Engaged Journalism, Marlene Harris-Taylor, will host that panel discussion. The program is a collaboration between the City Club of Cleveland and St. Luke's Foundation. Time now for a quick break, but when we return, we're going to talk about surviving the holidays. Whether you're going through a rough time or just don't like the pressure the holidays can bring, we'll have that conversation. This is The Sound of Ideas. I'm Jenny Hamill. We'll be right back. At 9.30, you're tuned into The Sound of Ideas right here on WKSU, Ideastream Public Media. Support for our programming today is provided by The Legal Aid Society of Cleveland, securing justice for and with its Northeast Ohio neighbors through legal representation and advocacy for systemic change. Working with the community to address fundamental challenges like access to safe and affordable housing. ExtendJustice.org.
Sumacare, with Medicare Advantage plans from Canton to Cleveland and Youngstown to Toledo. Sumacare is an HMO and HMO POS plan with a Medicare contract. Enrollment in Sumacare depends on contract renewal. More at sumacare.com slash Medicare Radio. First Federal Lakewood, helping businesses in the community bank with confidence for over 85 years. An SBA preferred lender offering loans, personalized guidance, and money market accounts with above average interest. More at ffl.net. Member FDIC. City Year. City Year makes a difference in the lives of students by placing AmeriCorps mentors in public school classrooms. Students feel supported and stay on track to graduation. Cityyear.org. You're with the Sound of Ideas from Ideastream Public Media. I'm Jenny Hamill. Thanks for staying with us this hour. As we enter the holiday season, it is important to acknowledge that for some, this time of year can be really tough to navigate emotionally, especially if you're dealing with loss, separation, grief, or isolation. The pressure to be joyful as well, from Thanksgiving to New Year's, is ever-present, from the media to commercials, work and school, to your own family and friends. To end today's show, we're going to have a conversation about how to survive the holiday season, whether you are dealing with grief, isolation, or, or just indifference. And we've invited two experts from the Cornerstone of Hope to weigh in. Joining us, Mark Tripodi, founder and CEO of Cornerstone of Hope. Mark, thanks for calling in. Jenny, thanks for having us this morning. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And Julia Elifrit, Education Director and Clinician at Cornerstone of Hope. Thanks so much for joining us as well. Good morning. Thanks for having us. And if you'd like to join the conversation with a thought, um, if you struggle through the holiday season and are willing to share, please call us 866-578-0903 or 216-578-0903. You can email us at soi at ideastream.org or you can tweet us. We're at Sound of Ideas. So, Mark, uh, you dealt with a tragic loss about 20 years ago, which inspired you to start Cornerstone of Hope. Can you talk about your story uh, with me and our listeners? No, oh, absolutely. I know in the beginning you announced Julie and I as experts, and I, I would say Julie is the expert, but my expertise in a sense has come through just my wife and I's and our family's personal experience. And unfortunately, um, we suddenly lost our three-year-old son back in May of 2000 uh, to meningitis, and uh, you never really prepared for that. It was, it was, uh, I mean, it was sudden. It was, you know, an emergency one room one night thinking he had the flu, and within 20, you know, in less than 24 hours, we came home uh, without our son. He had died, um, and it was like we, you know, you just never really prepared for that. And I know there's some people out there that deal with you know, whether it be expected or unexpected loss. And it, 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 regardless of the situation or the circumstances, it's just something that my wife and I certainly weren't prepared for. And in many ways, it was just an absolute traumatic shock to our entire being. And that's, uh, it's, it, you know, <clears throat> I, you, as we navigated the holidays, even, even to this day, you know, it's, it, it's 23 years later, this is still in our family, one of the toughest times of the year. Um, and I just want to give people that are, you know, like you mentioned in your in your intro, uh, whether it be grief or isolation or just the family pressures, um, you know, Julia can speak to this, like the holidays are a stressful time anyways, right? And then you on, on top of that, you add grief or whatever families are suffering or going through. And it just, uh, um, it's, it's it's a catalyst for even more stress and front and and and, uh, and difficult during the holiday times and we've experienced that for many years well first let me tell you how incredibly sorry I am for your loss um, I just can't imagine anything um, more heart-wrenching and so my heart goes to you um, um, in hearing your story to both of you you know Julia I'm curious I you know the first few holidays must have been you know incredibly just uh, difficult to navigate. Um, how did that alleviate over the years? Yeah, I think like Mark said, the holidays can be difficult anyway. Um, the pressure to have the perfect Hallmark tree and the Hallmark experience with your family and all that, just in, the, in general, it's a stressful time. Add to that loneliness and depression and mental health concerns and divorce and there's all kinds of stuff that can make the holidays really, really stressful. 
I think the loss of a loved one is the most difficult thing we can ever go through. So add that to a time when holidays are about tradition, and tradition almost always includes family. We always go to Grandpa's for Thanksgiving. We go to Colorado for Easter. Um, tradition always includes family. Well, when somebody in the family is missing, that just messes up all of our traditions in a, in a lot of ways. And so I think that's what makes it difficult because traditions always always include family. And really, Mark, I, I, I did want to hear your personal experience with this. So those first few holidays after you lost your child, I mean, oh, yeah. it just... Uh, uh, how did how did that get better for you? No, absolutely. I would say this, and you <clears throat> know, in many ways, when, as I reflect back on my wife Christy and I, what we what we did, it was, um, it sounds like so sad, but I mean, it's it's really, I'm just being vulnerable with you right now. I mean, we did when our son died; he was the middle of three children, and so we had our our oldest was almost that first Christmas was uh, without our son daughter was almost two we had another daughter that was about six and so we tried to put on a good front for them right I mean we did the Santa Claus picture sure. and uh, I can just remember it, it was just like one of the it was uh, it was hard it was just so hard for us to even get them dressed up to try to go to a mall and and even pretend that things were really happy and joyful like Julia was mentioning uh, and I remember for many years uh, like literally when the kids would go to bed Christmas night, you know, after opening gifts and things like that, my wife and I would take down that tree. It would be on the front lawn corner for the city to pick up like the very night of Christmas. And I know, you know, my gosh, that sounds awful. That sounds so sad. And, but that's just, that's where we were. We just were trying to grind to get through it. Um, and so I think, you know, but to kind of like over the years, um, being Christians, being Catholic Christians, we, we really have leaned into the reason for the season. I know that sounds so cliche, but that's that's we've added a lot of. Um, I mean, for us, it's a we, we've we've leaned in on our faith and, and celebrating Jesus's birthday and celebrating, you know, how we um, do things for one another down the holiday during the holiday seasons and our extended family. And that's that's been that's been a source of um, of hope for us and and what's brought a lot of meaning even amidst the suffering for for the years of. Uh, you know, again, celebrating your, the holidays without a loved one. And you turned your 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 deep sadness and heartache into something good, um, and 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 leveraged that pain um, into to founding the cornerstone of hope. So tell me when that kind of energy started be absolutely. focusing on on maybe doing something new. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, I always say like. Um, for my, it was really born out of a mother's tears. My wife was um, a stay-at-home mom um, and taking care of the kids, and she did. She felt like a prisoner in her own home, where I had somewhat of an outlet uh, as a provider and going to work, and and um, I had a little bit of diversion, you know, in my day-to-day -day week uh, of, of working and providing. Um, and so she, we probably had this thought within the first year because we were a family that sought support immediately. My wife and I were looking to go to counseling. We were trying to find groups, not only for us, but for our kids. And it was difficult to find support. When we found it, it seemed somewhat unorganized or very expensive. And um, it was really born out of our experience of reaching out for support, thinking, oh my gosh, this could be done so much better. And we really, and, and I say this in a very serious, serious way, like God put it on our heart to do something with that pain, to try to transform that pain into purpose and to create a place where other people who had suffered the loss of a loved one, not just the death of a child, but whatever relationship that loved one had when they died. You know, we, 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 we serve families a cornerstone of hope um, for families that have lost children, that have lost their spouse. Whatever your relationship is with that loved one, uh, we have a lot of programs um, that, I know I'm fast tracking, but that's that's what we did. We, we, we created a grief center based upon our own experience of we kind of asked ourselves one question, you know, what would have we wanted if we were to ever to go through this again? And we're proud to say that Cornerstone of Hope has, has really uh, evolved into that uh, space in Northeast Ohio and Central Ohio and even in the Lima community throughout the state of Ohio. So um, we have a lot of different programs, counseling, support groups, kids camps, retreats, memorial services, 
and even a lot more programs around the holiday times. We do an ornament workshop, a Christmas candlelight service, all to serve fam families who are suffering from grief uh, after the death of a loved one. And Julia, as someone who has decades of experience in the bereavement field, I mean, how do your clients talk to you about how the holiday season is particularly hard after experiencing loss? Again, it's because so many times it's a family member that was integral part of that holiday tradition. So what we talk about is really you have three choices with any tradition that you have. You can keep it exactly the same, mm -hmm. you can completely eliminate it, or you can change it. So if you always cooked Thanksgiving meal at your house, you can eliminate it and say, we're going to Aunt Susie's this year. Or you can change it. You can say, I'm opening up my house, but somebody else got to make all the, the turkey and the sides. Or you can just uh, keep it exactly the same. And for every tradition, um, you have to make that choice, knowing that. If you change your tradition, if you do not put a tree up this year, that doesn't mean that next year you can still put one up. It just means that for this year, here's what I have to do to survive. Uh, because grief, again, affects us physically, mentally, spiritually, in every way. And it, it's about surviving the holidays. It's not right now about thriving and going to the mall and singing Christmas carols. It's about how do I literally go from mid-November till January 2nd and survive it. That's the goal. Let's a go. A lot of people make a decision to get out of Dodge for the holidays. They'll go to Colorado skiing for the week of Christmas or they'll go to Florida. And that's what many, many grieving people do. And that just is just too hard to be at home in the house and not have a tree. And um, there's no right or wrong. It's whatever you and your family need to do to survive. Yeah, that's a great point. Let's go ahead and take a call from uh, Josie, who's calling in from University Heights. Josie, thanks for listening to The Sound of Ideas and uh, calling us this morning. Good morning. As Julie just said something that really hit home to me, and that's what I was going to say. It's just like uh, when I was young, my dad died, and so the tradition was Christmas and just died with him. And so I just, instead of like trying to change the holiday or anything, I just basically like eliminated it for 20 years and like didn't celebrate any holidays. Like I did not, I struggled really hard with that. And my mom did her best to try and make everything nice and fun. And we would do stuff on Christmas Eve, but Christmas day, I just never wanted to be bothered. I just stayed to myself. I'm like NBA plays basketball from noon to midnight. And that's what I would do. And honestly, now I, I married and I have two kids and our whole goal is to um, change the traditions and add on to them now. Well, wow, sorry, I didn't, hearing what she said really got me. <laughs> oh, Josie, I'm um, so sorry to hear about that. I mean, is, is there a point now where it's gotten better for you? Um, it's so good now. It's so good now. Um, my kids, like, I'm right now, I have my turkey. I'm about to start, you know, brining it. And we're having our whole family at our house. And I'm really just, like, trying to open up because I want my kids to at least experience the joy that I did have until my dad died. So it took a while, but... I'm finding joy in the holidays again, but I just wanted to share that. But Julie, thanks for saying that. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I'm so sorry that you had that loss. And do you find that, Julia, for a lot of people, it is just about time um, and, and going through your own grieving process and, 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 and finding, uh, you know, that, that that can evolve as well? For sure. But time time just ticks by. Time alone doesn't do anything. It's what you do at that time. It's the intentional feeling the sadness of grief. It's connecting with other grievers by being in a support group. It's what you do at that time that's important. But, yeah, the first couple of years after loss, you're just numb. You're going through the motions. Things aren't a priority. You're just existing. And so you do need to get through that those first phases. But, again, I would say what you do at that time is really, really critical to the healing process. Mark, I'm curious. Did anyone, any of your friends or family, do anything that was helpful for you and your wife um, in those first initial years when you were, you know, kind of in an absolutely, uh, I would say, dark place? Mark? Seems like we may have lost Mark. So I, I, I want to go ahead and... Um, 
play some tape from one of our own. Um, the Sound of Ideas team had posted on social media that we were going to approach this topic about grief in the holidays. And a very familiar voice to our listeners came forward and said she'd be willing to talk about her extremely difficult year of dealing with loss. Um, Karen Kassler had uh, this voice message to give us. I'm Karen Kassler. You've probably heard me on the air as the State House Bureau Chief for Ohio Public Radio and Television. A year ago, my family got together for our first Thanksgiving without my mom. She had died only two weeks before, after 12 days in the hospital. She'd had surgery for a broken leg and never woke up. It was tough and draining, but we had food and drinks and even some laughs, and we made it through. What I didn't know is that five days later, my husband would die of a heart attack in the middle of the night. The world just stopped. I couldn't work. My son couldn't go to school. We had a Christmas tree with lights that my husband had put up, and that was it. All the traditions we look forward to, going to the Nutcracker, an annual auction for a charity we love, a family Christmas Eve party, all of that was just hollow. Instead of shopping for gifts and playing Christmas music in the car, I was planning two celebrations of his life, one here in Columbus and one in his hometown in New Jersey. It was actually turned out to be the best moments because I got to hear memories from people he grew up with and I could look around and see the friends and family that he and I love the most. And those people, my family and friends, were my everything. They brought us food, checked in all the time, stayed the night, and they kept us going. And we kept that tree up through those awful dark weeks after Christmas with the lights on every night. This year has been hard and lonely. There are good days and bad days. The house is really quiet most of the time, and some nights can be excruciating. And I admit I'm bitter. My son is a senior, and his dad and grandma will never see him graduate and go on to college and whatever else is in front of him. And the holidays will never be like they were. I know I'm lucky to have wonderful people around me, and I do have happy memories of the holidays and other great times, which I know a lot of people don't. My heart is still broken, but it goes out to those who are suffering this and every year. Mark, that was Karen Kassler um, from Idea Stream talking about those times when people were talking about her loved ones were some of the best of times, but the loneliness pervades. D- does that resonate with you? It does. I think that it speaks to grief being a journey. I mean, that's why we talk about it's it's not a, it's just not a one one uh, life experience uh, when you go through the loss of a loved one. Um, it's a journey. There are, there are certain milestones, you know, she, she mentioned in that, in her, uh, in her writing of, you know, the, her husband will never see her son graduate from high school or some of the other milestones that, 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 that go on without your loved one. And, and that's why, that's why, you know, we can confidently and safely say it's okay to grieve many years later. Um, because, um, I mean, even for us this day, I mean, we, we have a large family, uh, we're grandparents now, and there's still that, that bitter, every, every, every holiday, every birthday, every picture is, is, is always bittersweet. Uh, it's not as debilitating as it was in those, uh, as it was early on, but I can tell you he's, he's, our son is thought about every day, just like, um, like you said, your, your colleague there commented, it's, 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 these are these everyday losses that, that, that lasts a lifetime and you can find purpose and meaning in life again. And I think, you know, part of it's okay to reach out for help. Um, and you know, we have a, a three word mantra at Cornerstone, like never grieve alone. That's why all of our programs are, are geared toward, um, uh, you know, for families to feel heard and to connect with others, others that are grieving because even well-intentioned family members who provide support and memories and stories, uh, you know, a lot of times they're not going home to an empty house. And, uh, and so, uh, we, 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 we develop this, this real, this family of, of grievers that come together and support with one another throughout the year. And, and, and certainly during our programs. So well, grief is something that you don't get over. Grief is something that you learn to live with. As Mark said, it's, it's a destination. It's and not a destination. It's a journey. And so one of the things that's important to remember is that you could get over certain types of losses. You could get over somebody stealing your car. You can get over losing a job. But you don't get over people. You learn to live without them, and that's the goal. And so, so many times people think, I want my grief to get smaller and smaller and smaller over the years. And I don't think that's what happens. I think our grief stays the same because we're always going to miss that person. We're always connecting. But our capacity to hold that grief, 
we enlarge ourselves around it. We incorporate that person into our life, into our holidays, into our everyday existence. They, they move forward with us. We don't move on. We move forward with that person just in a different way, just in a different way. Let's go ahead and take a call from Lori uh, calling in from Wadsworth this morning. Lori, thanks for listening to The Sound of Ideas. Go Good ahead. morning. Good morning. My, que- my morning, question Lori. was how, as somebody who's hosting, and I have a daughter who's now separating from her husband. We lost a grandfather. And my son lost his his um, child, and we're oh, we're pulling everybody all together. And how do I make room for the grief without allowing it to consume the space? And how what can I do to facilitate them not having to deal with the happy expectations of the holidays? That's a great question. Julia. You want to go first? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and thank you for being the host that that, that recognizes that. I think that if I think it's important to say people's names, and so many times I hear a client say, "Well, we don't want to bring it up because we want grandma to start crying." You know, grandma's thinking about it. You're not bringing up anything. Mm. But if we can just say, "Man, we really miss dad this year," or Joey would have loved this green bean casserole, and they, anytime you can use somebody's name, it makes it personal. It, it's a great thing to say, "How are you doing since Joe died?" or "How are you doing since your husband died?" better to say how you doing since Joe died because you don't ever hear that person's name. I think if we acknowledge the grief that's in the room at the start of the holiday, yes, everybody's going to cry. It's going to be difficult, but then you can move forward with the holiday tradition in a much healthier, much more positive way. If you celebrate Christmas, I always recommend putting a stocking on a mantle for that person that you lost. And during this season, everybody write a favorite memory and tuck in that stocking. And then on Christmas Eve, as a family, you sit around, you read those stories, you laugh, you cry, you remember, and then you've done that grief piece. And then on Christmas morning, it's a little bit better. You can enjoy opening presents with the kids because you've taken a moment to acknowledge that grief and acknowledge the person that you've lost. That's so important. Mark, you wanted to add something? Yeah, no, I think, I, again, I, you got to make space, Lori, for sure. I mean, you, you're, you're, what you're questioning is, like, you don't want it to... Um, you don't want to live in that grief. You might need to create a space to sit in it for a while that evening. And and I and I think I know for my wife and I and our uh, we like we wanted to hear Bobby's name. We wanted to um, we wanted to talk about it. So um, you know we um, that that's something that it, it is. It's not it's not like oh if, if I don't hear his name I'm going to forget about it. That's not the case. I I think you do create a, a space of. Uh, some time for people to share memories and for people to talk about it. If there's a favorite dish that one of your loved ones enjoyed, I mean, you just say it out loud, like, oh, my gosh, this was the favorite dessert of so-and-so or the favorite dish. And um, I, I think, you, I, I think, and what, but, you know, there's no right or wrong either, right? So um, I think you're, just by you calling today shows your heart and your compassion of wanting to honor your loved ones that have died and gone before you. And, and uh, um just prayers for you and your family for all you're going through, for sure. Absolutely. Let's take the last four minutes and talk about um, another aspect of going and surviving through the holidays. You know, I think there's people that just find it tough. Um, Maybe they're not a holiday person. Maybe they feel more alone. And the lights and the presents and and the commercials and, and everything shows this kind of idealized version of what the holidays are that can make it especially tough. We got a listener who tweeted, it's the toughest time of year, loads of nieces and nephews, but none of my own. I enjoy their joy, but I feel so distant. I think people can really feel othered by the holidays if they don't kind of live out that, um, you know, again, idealized version of the holiday. So, Julia, um, do you have thoughts on that and how people can feel less alone in that? Absolutely. The, the holidays, again, are stressful, especially during grief. I would say just a couple of reminders. One is holidays are always hard after a loss. So just remember to go easy on yourself. Don't put more pressure on yourself to have that perfect Hallmark holiday. Um, whatever day it is, Thanksgiving, Christmas, it may be a hard day. But you as a griever have survived hard days before, and you'll survive this one. Just remember that. You have permission to change your mind about plans, take breaks, change things up. Um, You're not responsible for meeting anybody else's holiday wants at your own expense. So you have to take care of you regardless of everything else. 
And then guilt about enjoying holidays sometimes comes up in grief. People feel bad that they feel happy. But just remember, your connection to your loved one doesn't live in your pain. It lives in your love for them and your memories and how they live on in your life. And that's how you want to celebrate them during the holidays. And Julia, would you say not feeling pressured includes things like going to the parties or yes. or or going shopping? Going to the mall where they have Christmas music playing and everybody's happy in the hustle bustle. Don't do that. Order all your gifts to have mine this year. Do whatever makes it easy and tolerable for you. Yep. And and Mark survival. Yeah, I'm I'm curious, Mark, do you think there are ways that people who are just kind of you know, maybe not embracing the holiday season, how they can can thrive um, during this time when so much emphasis is put on that. No, I know. And, and a lot of times, with, with, like with the tweet, you know, the caller that had, had texted or emailed in, I mean, it's, you know, it wasn't necessarily loss. It was just more loneliness and maybe not having their own family around. And, I, you know, I, I that's a reminder to me, again, as, as uh, being a Christian that, uh, this is not home. This is not heaven. You know, life is not perfect here. And it's, I wish that we could, um, you know, have that magic wand and, and wave it and like all of the sufferings and just the isolation and everything go away during this time. And sometimes it is just, I mean, it sounds, we just have to do everything we can to get through those holidays. And, and remember that, you know, um, God didn't promise an easy life. He promised an eternal life. And there will be a day where, you know, whether it be whatever your favorite holiday is, that that's, that's what, what heaven will be times a million, right, um, when all this pressure and stress and isolation goes away. And so, um, and that's why for us and our family, like, you know, we've, we've really kind of embraced Christmas, not in a secular way, but in, the, in a really a religious way uh, of, of, of the real purpose of it, that we have an opportunity uh, to just give all of our, our our stress and our anxiety and our uh, struggles to our Lord, and uh, you know, and His will be done ultimately. But my, my, you know, we're just it's just a constant reminder that we're not made. Uh, you know, heaven is or the, this earth is not perfect, and Mark, I think that's what your yeah person was experiencing for sure. Mark Tripodi, founder and CEO of Cornerstone of Hope. And Julia Elifrit, Education Director and Clinician at Cornerstone of Hope. I found this segment incredibly helpful, and uh, I, I really appreciate you joining us for this conversation. Happy Thanksgiving to so both of you. And um, to all of the people listening, you know, if you struggle through the holidays, we do have resources on our website. You can go to ideastream.org slash SOI um, and know not to grieve alone. I thought that was a great thing that Mark said. So thank you both so much. Thank you. Jenny, thank you so very much. And we have programs. You can go to our website, cornerstoneofhope.org. We have an ornament workshop coming up and a Christmas candlelight service uh, coming up as well. You can get information on our website. Thank you. Sounds so good. Uh, If you missed any portion of this program, you can find us online or listen to the Sound of Ideas podcast. You can hear a rebroadcast of this conversation tonight at 9 on 89.7 WKSU. I'm Jenny Hamill. Thanks for listening. Support for WKSU is provided by Oberlin Artist Recital Series, presenting MacArthur Award-winning pianist and Oberlin alumnus Jeremy Deck at Finney Chapel. Thursday, November 30th at 7.30 p.m. More information at oberlin.edu slash artsguide. Great Lakes Theater, presenting the 35th anniversary production of their holiday classic, A Christmas Carol, on stage at the Mimi Ohio Theater Playhouse Square. Tickets at 216-241-6000 or greatlakestheater.org. You're listening to 89.7 WKSU Kent, a public media service licensed to Kent State University and operated by IdeaStream Public Media. WKSU serves Northeast Ohio through HD and on WCPN Lorraine Cleveland 